Uh, thanks so much, um, Ms. Stephanie. Thank you uh, for talking to Deutsche Welle. Um, we're speaking on the day that the NATO Secretary General um, has been visiting your country, Kiev, um, and it was striking to hear him say to NATO countries that their delays in, in delivering uh, weapons and ammunition to Ukraine has resulted in a scenario where we have the Russian armed forces making ground. Is Ukraine going to lose this war if Western allies, if your allies, do not step up in the way of more commitments, but also making good on the commitments that they've already made? Well, uh, indeed, uh, this is the second visit of Secretary General to Kiev throughout uh, the war, and it's very uh, important to see that both President Zelensky and Secretary General have a uh, open air uh, press conference uh, just under the under the open skies. Uh, it it is a very symbolic element, uh, giving us the hope that now, when the decision of the U.S. Congress has been taken, the massive disruptions in the delivery that we had over the last six months, which affected a uh, massive uh, uh, massive causes of attacks to civilian infrastructure, simply because of uh, shortages in the in the ammunition and inability to make all the elements of air defense operational because of the lack of the missiles. Uh, this is uh, something with, that we have uh, overpassed. Uh, the, the new uh, contributions are on their way. So at least we can speak about the security of the critical infrastructure and security of the cities, which gives us more time to concentrate on the front line. Uh, in fact, sec Secretary General Stoltenberg is very well briefed in the security situation. Just last week, uh, he, uh, upon the request of Zelensky, made a meeting of the defense ministers. To, and uh, there is a number of decisions which are already on the table on uh, urgent measures on air defense. Uh, the follow-up has been today in Kiev. Uh, and. Uh, uh, it's very clear that Ukraine will always find a way to, to find for, 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 for itself. But I think it's not something that should care uh, less that the, the whole democratic world could lose. And I think that there are plenty of decisions on the table, both at the EU platform, but also at the NATO, which could really make uh, Ukrainian people feel more secure. But the front line is much more stabilized. You talked about the U.S. Um support package which was substantial but it was also half a year late and could be the last have you factored in that this could be the last support package coming from the united states in light of the fact that there is an election in november that completely changes the game uh, well, uh, for us, it's uh, the clarity and uh, delivering on its commitment is it's important because the decision that we have now uh, on uh, the military support for Ukraine voted by Congress, this has been part of the commitments agreed that the Rammstein format among more than 50 uh, partners um, uh, more than half a year ago. So, and uh, uh, it was very important that uh, you cannot substitute this disruption in a, in. A in provision of military support because these are not the finances not the loans you can get somewhere it's the physical military equipment which is uh, only where it has been committed for so it's not only ukraine but all the allies were not ready for this kind of scenario so it's important to have this decision for this year but for the next year of course we will be ready for any kind of scenarios and we are working hardly with the european union to build a stronger european defense pillar we're working hard on advancing on implementation of the european defense industrial strategy but also mobilizing addis additional resources to um, ensure that our capability uh, as european uh, institutions are in defense is, is stronger and we are also working on a number of decisions for the washington summit of nato uh, in particular when it comes to um, uh, measures which nato as an alliance could take to secure uh, airspace and there are a number of discussions on the table and i'm sure that we will be able to see some of them already in washington so uh, for us it was really important to have the decision for this year it was in fact vital and for the next year we still have time to advance and 
to learn our lessons and to make sure that we have a backup scenarios even for the strongest commitments um, at the same time uh, different to what we had right now it's already now where we have a significant amount of bilateral security commitments with France with Germany uh, most um, uh, most ambitious with the Great Britain and this has been recently now that Ukraine and US will have a bilateral security commitment so uh, from the landscape point of view the situation will totally be different next year the new mobilization uh, legislation has received a lot of backlash um, especially within Ukraine for a number of reasons one uh, being that there is no scope for demobilization for people who've been on the front lines for a significant period of time but also the situation around men outside of Ukraine having restricted access to consular services because of the new legislation. Um, in addition to concerns raised by human rights groups, some experts say it's not going to be very effective. Is this piece of legislation going to help you from where you stand, from where your government stands? Is it going to help increase the number of troops that are required because this is anywhere from 300,000 to half a million? Well, uh, it's really interesting to hear such an in-depth understanding of uh, and um, uh, knowledge about so many nuances. So let's start from the point that it's not a new legislation. So the le legislative base for the mobilization and the serving in armed forces has been there even before these amendments have been adopted. So the procedure was there, including the elements of the demobilization. There was an idea because basically we have a full-scale war. This is a massive military engagement and it requires some procedures needs to be improved including the demobilization procedures because we're talking about the huge amount of people uh, which need not only to uh, leave the the front line but somebody who will substitute them so this needs to be discussed in more details at the same time uh, uh, president has a power and he made some decisions to dem demobilize some troops so it doesn't uh, restrict us from making this decision secondly we need to make an audit of the potential potential for the mobilization. Thus, we need to make sure that we have the proper data of those men who are abroad, but also those men who are among the internally displaced persons, because this is our almost 5 million people within the country uh, of all people who have been internally displaced. So there's been a massive shuffle. So we need the data to be collected. So we have taken, undertaken some temporary measures allowing us to have this audit through uh, provision of the consular service and registration of a male Ukrainians uh, so that we could have the data. It doesn't necessarily immediately affect the mobilization to the front line. It's just the collecting of the data. I mean, uh, and uh, it's really uh, uh, not very good to, uh, you know, um, uh, make, uh, make any assessments in that regard because the war is in Ukraine. The, the, the shelling are there and they're like the best of our people are dying and fighting on a front line and uh, this is there's no good solution when it comes to serving in the armed forces in a country of war but the solutions should be done because we have to survive and we have to fight but rest assured that we will do our best to make it uh, with the understanding that the human life is on the first turn. Um, I have two more questions for you. Uh, the first one being, we are in Europe, um, weeks away from a parliamentary election here that could see uh, far-right uh, parties make significant gains in terms of their representation uh, in the parliament. We know that a lot of these uh, parties are opposed to European enlargement. Um, they have also uh, been critical of increased support to Ukraine. What are your sort of feelings around that? Well, of course, I wouldn't make a general line in, a, in this negative connotation about the different radical or war far right groups in the parliament. It's already a reality that there are tendencies like that. But at the same time, not uh, you cannot equalize everybody because we have different situation in a, with the different political groups in the different countries. And mostly we see that uh, um, even those political alliances which were critical, they we always 
always find the ground to work. I'm speaking about the Slovak uh, Ukrainian relations. I'm speaking with the um, on the relations with the new uh, Dutch uh, with the Dutch Parliament. So uh, we have been able to find the common grounds on most on most of the issues. So so uh, we are looking uh, and following the elections closely. But I don't think that this is a momentum where uh, this kind of simple solutions could be taken. It's in fact, it's about the future of Europe, and uh, it's not only Ukraine which is a, a st at stake as a country. It's the capability of European Union to defend itself because the war is at NATO borders, at EU borders, and I don't think that something which is used as the pre-electoral rhetorics could really be materialized in a policy because it's it's about the the security policy of every country. Uh, my final question, uh, Deputy Prime Minister. Of course, your forte is is Europe, but we know that uh, President Zelensky, at least, is expected to be visiting uh, South Africa at some point uh, in in this year, uh, presumably uh, to to secure political support outside of places like Brussels, where we are today. Um, could you talk to us about how important that is for Ukraine to be able to win over? Uh, hearts and minds in other parts of the world, in, in the global south, for example, parts of the world that have been perhaps more reluctant than here in the West? Uh, I think it's very important that we encircle the discussion about 10-point uh, peace formula of President Zelensky because it's not only a peace formula for Ukraine, it's the real uh, new security pact, global security pact, which allows, uh, gives a lot of answers and a new potential to uh, ensure the security of every part of the world where there could tension co could come. It's about the nuclear security, it's about the security and the protection of the human rights, uh, it's about uh, uh, prisoners of war. It's about the, the uh, justice and accountability for the crimes committed. So uh, we're looking forward for having the Peace Formula Summit in Switzerland. And uh, it will only be successful if all parts of the world would find a common background on that. And the background of it is the um, respect to the UN uh, Charter. Uh, so, so I think that the nearest commitment and the nearest ability to have this uh, global global discussion will be in Switzerland already in June this year. Please allow me, indulge me one more. We have an audience uh, in parts of the world where the narrative around NATO, this war, Russia, is not balanced. Could you tell people who are under the impression, who receive this propaganda, that NATO aggravated this war, what is your appeal to these people in terms of what they should understand about what has happened to your country and the price that you are paying? Uh, it's um, it's a very interesting question when we are talking about the role of NATO in uh, in uh, this uh, in current security architecture in European Union. Uh, basically, uh, I'm sure that NATO could have prevented this war by uh, making a strong commitment to Ukraine, making Ukraine a member of the alliance, thus granting the security of Ukraine and also uh, being in a in a direct dialogue uh, even with the Russian Federation. So, but at this point of time. Uh, uh, it is a war of aggression of Russian Federation against Ukraine and NATO has not played a role here and uh, it's a bilateral uh, commitment of the allies to to support Ukraine's ability to restore its uh, its independence so I would say that NATO have never been playing a role uh, in this uh, in this aggression but it might play a role uh, in uh, ending this war and making uh, um, uh, European continent secure again, both by putting uh, uh, a security guarantees for Ukraine, but also for Russia at some point. Thank you very much, ma'am.